Hey guys, before we get started today, just wanted to let you know, this is kind of like a one-off situation we're doing for you, a little very minor fallout break of two vampire classics back-to-back. -back. It's been a while, we missed you, hopefully you missed us. Hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to the Remedial Film Class Podcast, Fall Outbreak. I'm your host, Dan. And I'm Travis. And I'm George. Holy red dragon, Batman. <laughs> that was, that's a hell of a piss, Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. Sorry, it's been a up. minute, and we have returned. And uh, George, uh, how was your red dragon-like experience tonight with Dracula and Nosferatu? It was pretty good. Did you realize you watched the same movie twice? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Did you realize that I watched the same that you watched the same oh. movie twice in a row? I uh, kind of they were a little Actually, I think they, they were, were a lot, lot different. different. Yeah. Okay. All right, and Travis, man, long time no talk to. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great yourself. No, I'm doing I'm doing pretty good. Now, were either of these first time watches for you, Travis, or have you seen both these a hundred times? <sighs> this is probably the first time I've watched uh Dracula in about twenty years. Fifteen years probably. And Nosferatu, I think I watched once in college. I watched it a couple times after that so probably three times in the past 30 years okay so you're familiar this isn't all throwing you in the deep end we're here just waiting for george in our coffins waiting for nightfall <laughs> <laughs> i do love the dracula yeah. theme bram stoker's dracula it's fine uh <laughs> i don't write the, the lyrics they do when they write the songs uh yeah no it has been a little while. Uh, we haven't done an outbreak since the spring of, what, 22? With, yes. With the outbreak of zombies. Well, now we've got an outbreak of uh, vampires. Very scary Vampire. stuff, guys. Yes. Vampires, as my kids always said. Vampires. <laughs> Vampires. <laughs> I don't know where the A went. It just disappeared. <laughs> this is not Twilight. <laughs> now, George... Let's yes. stick to Nosferatu for a little bit, and then we'll get to the Dracula, then we'll wrap it all up. Basically, what we've done to you by making you watch two movies this week is to give you the kind of traditional Eastern European vampire, male vampire, uh, all of it traced back to Bram Stoker. You've heard of that guy, right? Uh, only from you guys. Uh, hmm. You guys have mentioned him a bunch of times. Really? Yes. Well, we have, of yeah. course. But mm, yeah, it's sad that we were your first, but that's <laughs> fine. Uh, well, they really don't cover Bram Stoker in school. Right? No. So it's just a matter of choice. Yeah, and I to. and honestly, I I still don't know like what Bram Stoker's Dracula means. Right. I think it just means the Dracula that we're all familiar with, right? Well, like, he's the ori the original story. It's kind of like the Night of the Living Dead. George Romero's Night of the Living Dead was the the one that everybody either copies or tries to beat. Yeah. So Bram Stoker's Dracula became the Harry Potter of yeah, but vampires. Like the, the details of his vampire are like the traditional vampire rules, yes. like, you know, the... You know, the sleeping in a coffin and the, you know, can turn into different animals and... Right. Doesn't have a reflection and so on and so forth. Like, I'm not sure how many of those things became lore from his book. That's the question because I know what, what's the uh, the origin. Are you going to go into origins of vampires, Dan? Is well, that like your, I am your not as <laughs> big of an expert on the vampire mythology as I am, say, the Jalo, 
right? I okay. haven't spent as much of my time in the depths of the crypts with the vampires. But one thing that kind of blew my mind is I'm poking around, because I've read Bram Stoker's Dracula. It was years ago, but I, it was good. It was fine. It wasn't as sexy as I was hoping, if I'm being honest. Right. Like, it's like Godfather. <laughs> There is no weird plan or no no B plot in Dracula think, involving okay. gigantic cavernous vaginas though. So it's already a win. That you know of. Well, that's true. Maybe it was really symbolism heavy. I don't know. Hmm. Dracula I mean, those coffins, I guess, could fit a whole man. Well, vampires are basically uh, you know, based on I guess the plague. But well, I guess it kinda it took on like an S T D kind of thing where it's like uh, in the seventies, and like vampires were almost like uh, the the whole bite thing, and the transferring the vampire onto the next. It became kind of like an STD kind of underlining. I don't know when, but well, we obviously haven't gotten there yet. No, I don't know that we will get there <laughs> in a definitive sense because one problem I have with the vampire genre, one reason we haven't really jumped into this yet on the show. With zombies, I can go, hey, there was zombies before Romero, and then Romero came and everything got good, right? Like, there's a, right. there's a point at which vampires are a lot murkier. Mm -hmm. uh, to oversimplify it, we can say that, like, there were vampires in a lot of mythologies and a lot of cultures across the world, and at some point, Bram Stoker wrote a book. And if right. we do it that way, that's our George Romero and from there, we can kind of take the same path we did with the zombies. But unfortunately, because Stoker's not directly involved in any of the movies, we don't have this, like, here's the main arc, you know, the, the main arc that we have, and then here's the little break-offs. Instead, it's just, right. like, immediately a bush of vampires, and it only gets more confusing into a garden of vampires. So right, because with mm. with Romero, you were able to sit there and go, okay, this he's allowed to change the lore because he created the lore, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, we're like oh, well, they're using tools, and they're like, well, it doesn't matter. He created it so he can make them use tools. Yep, he can he can do it. With he vampires, wants. he's like, you could go back to Victorian days and earlier and earlier, like medieval times, where like the the lore of the vampire is so old, you don't know what is. I guess you know, the stake in the heart and all that stuff and the garlic, that all is very, I don't want to say ancient, but it's pretty old. Yeah. So well, and people it's were wild. buried in the ground with cages around them <laughs> mm -hmm. back in the day. Yeah. Vampires in say the 1700s, 1800s in mythology, in your stories are as likely to be female as male. You might even say mm. that they trend more female than male. So Bram Stoker's, work is actually kind of you know it stands alone as like a, a unique piece because it is such a male centric vampire but then because that's the one that hits in the movies that kind of reframes it in our pop culture to where now I mean the breakfast cereal guy is a dude you know <laughs> well I, I read right. somewhere that the original story and the play that the Bela Lugosi movie was based on it wasn't as sexy like when it they almost made it more of of a seduction sexual thing later on it's weird to say that the dracula movie is sexy but you know the seduction but it's super aspect sexy of a vampire compared yeah. to like nosferatu <laughs> oh, he's very <hot>. strange <laughs> it's very strange he's hot What's uh, weird is uh, Max Shrek looked like that in real life. <laughs> That's There wasn't much makeup there. No. Oh, my gosh. No. Well, let's get into those for all two a bit. We'll get into Dracula. We'll just probably be all over the place because, you know. Yes. This is Because we be, watched two movies and we have ADD. This yeah. is going to be fun. Well, and we, we watched the same movie in two different uh, incarnations in a lot of ways. And so right, there will right. be a lot of compare contrast. It's going to be fun. I'm excited. George, are you excited? Yes, absolutely. Hooray! Uh, here's the thing, George. The movie Nosferatu, mm -hmm. made in Germany, released in 1922. Immediately, yep. the folks that made it got sued by Bram Stoker's family because it was a shot-for-shot -shot, uh, 
retelling of the Bram Stoker story with a few characters renamed and a few new plot elements. Uh, and Stoker's are uh, he's already dead by now, right? He died in like nineteen like twelve or something like that. Well, the book came out in eighteen ninety seven. Uh, right. Bram Stoker died in. 1912, yes, exactly. Yeah, so he never saw any of this to fruition. Interesting. It's a shame. Now, here's the thing that blew my mind, uh, thinking about this this weekend, because I spent a lot of time with my vampires trying to you know, build a worldview in, in this world. As I understand it, as a person who was born in the 80s, Bram Stoker's Dracula is this like old-time work that has always been with us in our culture. And eventually it got made into a movie because Universal was making movie mo- uh, monster movies. And you think, okay, well, yeah, I mean, they'd go back to the classics and they'd make monster movies. It is insane to me to think that 1922 is only t- like 25 years after the book is written. So as right. far as like the speed of, you know, literature spreading through the world at the time, you know, in the midst of all the things going on in the 19 teens and 1920s. That's I mean, pretty quick. It's a contemporary yeah. work. And I had never thought of it as that. And that blows my darn mind. Yeah. You would think it's like ancient text. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the way that <laughs> we not. continue to go back to Dracula as the source for our movies, right? It just feels like something that's always been there and eternal. And it's just something mm. we've all collectively gone back to. But to be so close to the starting point, that's crazy, guys. That's 100 years ago is all. Yeah. Yep. Weird. And George really doesn't even have the frame of reference of, like, all the added stuff, like the Vlad the Impaler and also, which makes the character even older. Like, you don't think about, you know, how how old that character is, like, 500 years old. Right. It's in, a, in our oh, yeah, yeah. history, it's, a, it's an older character, but this specific... Right telling this like you know amalgamation of all these things into a new uh paradigm essentially just 25 years before Nosferatu it just blows my mind I when I was growing up I always thought Bram Stoker wrote that book back when Shakespeare was around yeah I mean that's kind of the way we hold it in you know the same prestige as those works and yeah it's pretty fresh same with Anne Anne Rice like she's a modern author that covered vampires and it's like when you hear Anne Rice's name you think she's as old as Bram Stoker but there's a hundred year difference right there between the two yeah it's it's crazy Uh, and it's just it's there's a certain like amplification in our culture in pop culture that puts things on a pedestal in a way that you know whether or not they you know quote unquote deserve it it just it messes up our perspective on how old and new and significant these things are it still hurts my head but Nosferatu (laughs) is like the you know uh punk rock you know um unofficial what's the thing that's the rage against the machine it's the uh, basically unauthorized (laughs) unauthorized version of Bram Stoker's yeah and if the courts had had their way it may have been destroyed most mm. copies were, so it's it's kind of a miracle that we even have it because the look of Nosferatu, outside of any Bram Stoker references, the Max Schreck vampire is so iconic and so fucking oh God, yeah. scary looking that like he's, he's I can't great. imagine losing that. Yeah, and you know what's funny? I as much as I am into horror, when I was growing up, the only reference I had for Nosferatu was the Queen Under Pressure video. If you watch the music video for Under Pressure, that before the crescendo of the song in the video, they show that shadow creeping up the steps, and then okay. the door opens, and he's filling the entire door. It's that those iconic scenes. Yeah, I had never watched the movie. I was always so scared to watch it because that video freaked me out. That whole shadow with the hand coming, like all that stuff. Oh, that's like, crazy. It's so iconic, and everybody uses it, including The Shining, even though Dan says no. <laughs> well, I mean, they didn't use it, but you know, it's fine. it's, ref- it's referenced everywhere. <laughs> uh, I think my main point of reference growing up was "Are You Afraid of the Dark?" 
They had an episode mm. called Tale of the Midnight Madness, where they basically have the Nosferatu vampire uh, as a character. Like, the right. plot of the episode, I was going to make George watch it, but I mean, how many things can I make George watch in a week? But, you know, these two kids are at a theater, and a, a guy comes in, and he's like, hey, I'm going to show a, a movie that'll bring everyone to your house, you know, and it's uh, basically Nosferatu, but at one point, he comes out of the screen like the ring. Oh, shit. And like, no thanks. Yeah, pretty nope. fucking scary for a kid show. <laughs> nope. I was like, nope. Well, I was freaked out because when I was a kid, the, my only, um, I remember Salem's Lot, which I don't know if you've ever seen a Salem's Lot, but the no. the vampire in that movie, uh, Count Barlow or whatever, is basically based on the imagery of Nosferatu. So when you see it. You're like, ah, there there he is. In modern times, he hasn't changed. So they, they borrowed that completely. So when you see that as a nine-year-old kid, that's that's your vampire. Okay, so the way you guys are like holding this image up like as the scariest thing you've ever seen is funny to me because as I was watching and as I was making notes, I started shortening Nosferatu to Nasi. Nasi. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I love it. Nasi. Mm-hmm. I think Nasi looks so cool, and that's his real nickname, by the way. <laughs> I mean, Ooh, like, boy. I just, I, I love it. Um, I, yes. I love Nasi. He's my, we'll have to talk. My this. favorite vampire. I've only seen two vampires, but he's my favorite. Well, that's good. That's good to know because that makes me feel good. Because I'm watching it the first time in about 15 years, and I'm going, he's gonna hate this. It's so jerky. It's so, and then I was like listening to well, different soundtracks. I'm like, oh my god, let's find the right soundtrack for it, or it does it. So I'm glad you liked it. Y- yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm surprised how much I liked it. I, at first, I, you know, the you know the movie starts and there's the credits roll mm-hmm. first, and it's it's really shaky. It's like oh, all this stuff was printed on a piece of paper <laughs> and then filmed, you know. And it's a moving pitches. There's like, <laughs> there's like, there's like ten people in the whole movie. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, okay, it's one of those movies. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah. it's, it's gonna be like, it's like a Kevin Smith film. <laughs> yeah, I was. <laughs> I'm thinking like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, where there's only like seven people in the right. whole movie, so but it's still a be great good. movie, right. right? So I'm like, okay, that, that's fine. And then, and then I realize there's no audio. Nope. There's no dialogue. There, I'm like, this this movie is so old. Am I? Once I realize it, I go, well, I get that makes sense. Right. This is super duper old. So it wasn't like I was disappointed or like, oh, this is going to be a slog. I was just like, okay, this is totally but different. But it was possible. This is totally different. <laughs> right. Right. I was like, this is cool. I, it's kind of like, you know, like, you know, any kind of history that is, you know, who looks at like a, like a old Roman like chariot. And it's like, we have cars now. That's right. so dumb. It's like, no, no, it's not dumb. It's cool. Like, it's it's iconic. It's part of history. Right. That's how it used to be, you know? So I'm like, okay, well, I, I keep I keep watching. It's it. like watching Ben-Hur and be like, where are the motors? Like, why why aren't they just on motorcycles? Yeah. <laughs> so like, it would be so much better. I'm like, so anyway, I'm having all these realizations as the movie just starts. And then I realize I'm on the wrong audio track. The oh. wrong uh, soundtrack. Where? <laughs> and then, so I watched the first 10 minutes of the movie again on the different soundtrack, and I'm like, holy crap, yeah. the soundtrack makes or breaks the movie yeah. when there's no words. <laughs> it's like Halloween. Right? Like, they <laughs> laughed at Halloween until he put the score in. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so not that the not that the first one was, you know, was super bad. <laughs> the second one was, like, yeah, much more intense. I learned that when I was watching it, and it got to the part where... Um, Count Orlock is in his carriage going over the hills. And it's like, no, I'm yeah, like, yeah, no, yeah. that's not, it should be more eerie. So the second track was the a lot second, better. The second yeah. track was definitely more eerie, more creepy. It sound, the first track sounded like something like from a Buster Keaton movie, like just very, uh, like uh, the damsel in distress and the train coming. It was just very upbeat. And I, I felt it was, it needed to be a little more eerie. Okay. So, the main character is Hutter? Is Hutter. that Hutter? Yeah, the text Hutter, yeah. on the Kino Blu-ray that I have, the H's and the D's were like very fancy. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I think that's it, an H, but I had to look it up. 
It's a, it's a yeah. German font. That, that German was font. that was actually like one of my notes where I was like, I I wish this font was easier to read mm. because it's so important to read what's going on. Well, they couldn't. They didn't have Comic Sans back then. So. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, graphic designer joke. <laughs> that was pretty good. Cool. <laughs> I don't get the guitar jokes, but I can throw out graphic it's, designer no, jokes. It's, it's great. Everyone knows what Comic Sans is. <laughs> so one thing that blows me away, George, and I just want to tell you this up front yeah. so we can put this into perspective. The first Hollywood studio was built in 1909. Okay. In 1922, uh-huh. the same year that this movie came out, there was a company founded in Kansas City. Go KC. Called Laughogram. Have you ever heard of Laughogram? No, absolutely not. It was not. founded by this dude who's probably not going anywhere named Walt Disney. Hmm. I've heard of him. Yeah, he's he's, yeah, done, he's done a couple of things since then. But I really I'm in it for the old school stuff that he did in Kansas City. But right. I mean, Disney's not a thing yet. He's just founded his first company, and simultaneously this movie comes out. This is the literal Stone Age of cinema. Hmm. Yeah. And yet, like, Nosferatu's face is like the icon. Yes. Yes, it's so cool. At some point of this recording, you need to Google Max Shrek and see what he looks like without his makeup. I'll do it right now. I'll do it right now. <laughs> do you recognize that name, Max Shrek, that's come up on the show <laughs> before? <laughs> George, uh, does that ring yeah. a bell? Uh. You've heard it in a movie. You've heard it. <laughs> Keep talking like that. No, <laughs> I can't do. I can't do him. I'm trying to hide it because <laughs> I can't do it. Do you remember in Batman Returns, the mayor of Gotham, who had that really bonkers plan to steal electricity and put it in a giant capacitor, played by Christopher uh, Walken? Uh, yeah. His character name in that movie is Max Shrek, because Tim Burton gets off on black and white vampires, obviously. Ah, uh, ha, ha, ha. Oh, yeah. Ha, 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 ha. He's very influenced by the, the, those films. Yeah, that's why when I try to look up pictures of Max Shrek, I get uh, you Christopher get Walken. Walken. <laughs> <laughs> Max Shrek uh, Nosferatu. But that might show I just, in costume. I, I clicked on actor, like Max Shrek actor. Okay. Is that a good picture? Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, he looks, looks like he Count looks, Orlock. <laughs> yeah, he looks like without a vampire. The ears. He does. He looks like like an iconic vampire, even without makeup. Yes. So the casting was probably not hard. In fact, at all. just just the picture itself, like without you know, just just the way he looks, he looks like a vampire trying to fit in with normal society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he looks and like that's actually the vampire who would compared. greet Harker or you know uh, Renfield for the first time, like in. Mm. In a formal wear, just like, oh, I'm not threatening at all until yeah, I like take the, my second like the, form. Yeah, he's like the real Nosferatu's butler. Yes. Who answers the door and brings you tea and stuff. Yes, like the, the Trinity vampire where it's like he's he's playing multiple parts. He's yeah. he's the carriage driver. And, he's and, the and again, butler. we're just talking about what Max Shrek looks like without any in makeup. Just in real life. <laughs> Yeah, so. it's crazy. That's good. And he was pretty recluse. He didn't do many things. That's like his claim of fame is that movie. And that's it. You would think with that face and that ability to emote through that that characterization that he did, I would put him in every movie I make. I'd create a character for him, and, and I'd call his agent every time. There's a movie that yeah. we're going to talk about at some point, and it won't be part of this series. Uh, it'll come probably in the next season. There's an actor, similar time frame, similar background, who crosses over just like that, Travis, who takes that face to America and becomes a huge star in a way that Max Shrek just never did. It it boggles my mind that he was not, like, on everybody's casting list. Because, yeah, he's a silent movie actor, so your, your job is to emote... You're not you're not talking, so you have to char- do your character through your face and your hands and body position. And that scene, like on the boat, the ship, just it's so eerie to me to, 
even to this day, a hundred years later, that silhouette that holds up. People were like, "Is he? Is he for real? Is this real?" Yeah. To me, that's awesome. That's like Heath Ledger type shit. Yeah, he might actually live in an empty castle. Yeah, yeah. he like, might still this live movie, in an empty castle a hundred years he later. Might still, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he might, yeah. Like this movie could possibly be the very first found footage film ever made. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Because he might be real. <laughs> <laughs> that motherfucker <laughs> is He's not, not real. real. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing you'll notice, though, is uh, silent movie actors, a lot of them kind of fell out of favor as soon as the talkies came around, the mm. sound movies, because, you know, their voices weren't necessarily any good or at least trained. Their delivery wasn't necessarily right. We were still doing live sound and, you know, post syncing wasn't really a popular thing to do in a way that, you know, you wouldn't have like one actor, you wouldn't Millie Vanilli your way through a movie just to get Max Shrek into your movie. Mm-hmm. And True. so those limiting factors, you know, what can you do if it's 1928 or whatever when they start doing Unless your audio. actor looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Mel Gibson, because they did that for both of those guys. Right. Well, that was a long time. Voice- that was later. Right. True. Many years later. But... But I guess image wise, if if the person looks like what you need, like if Max Shrek fit the fit the bill, but his voice was terrible, they could have technically had the voiceover, yeah, and or made a mute, make a mute. I mean, here's the thing: uh, if slasher movies had started in 1930, Max oh, Shrek could have been every slasher villain. Yes. Uh, in fact, I would yeah. argue that he was definitely an inspiration for our friend Michael Myers. Uh, did yes, you catch? Definitely. The uh, it's his face in the window across the street, and it's a busy image, and he's just slightly out of center frame, and he's you know deadpan in the window, just staring Mm -hmm. straight up, just Michael behind the car. Yes, I was just like, that's the shot, like that, and then he does the the weird sit up, and I have that in my notes. Yeah, he does the Michael Myers (laughs) sit up. So is that the? Well, I wanted to bring that up when you brought up the Undertaker when we were talking about Michael Myers. I was like, yeah, but didn't the Undertaker take it from Nostradamus? Undertaker took it from Michael Myers, but Michael Myers definitely got it. Right, that's what I mean. Michael Myers, yeah. Like I saw that and I was like, oh shit, I'm putting that in my notes. That's a Michael Myers. (laughs) But sadly, John Carpenter didn't see this movie until much later. No. Right, later. right. <laughs> On point with the callbacks. Wow, jeez! <laughs> like we know, it's like a bicycle we're doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Hey, uh, speaking of Halloween, George, I'm going to need you to come with me back to last October, watching Halloween Ends, which I know uh, Travis loved very much. <laughs> yep. Uh, mm. Actually, I, I go back to Halloween Kills. Actually, is the one. Uh, Remember, that's the one Travis that's really favorite. likes. Remember that's my Evil Dies Tonight? Everybody loves Evil yes. Dies Tonight. Yes, yes, yes. Don't mm-hmm. remember that. Do you remember that there's a second uh, mental patient that's escaped and he's being chased by an angry mob even though he hasn't done yes. anything? Do you remember that whole scene? Yes, yes. Lifted straight out of this movie when Knock is being chased as the scapegoat. Yes. Like, yes. Halloween Kills was just <laughs> like, hey... We're doing Nosferatu, but nobody's going to remember it because nobody's watched that movie in a while. Yeah, and Halloween Kills would have been better if it was a silent movie, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, because then I would have to read Evil Dies Tonight Evil Dies <laughs> seven times. Well, you wouldn't have had to read it on the placard, though. They could have just put it on hats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> you clipped your mic so hard. Damn. It's well, okay. <laughs> we're, we're keeping it. Fine. Oh, it stays in. Apologies to our listeners who've now been made deaf by our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it stays uh, in. Yeah, that's what she said. We now pause for a station identification. <laughs> okay, so um, <laughs> some of some of the other things that I wrote down here, um, is that in the very beginning of this movie, Nasi, Nos- Nasi, uh, everything moves really quick. Like they, th- there's nothing really else to do except for introduce characters. So they're like, boom, boom, mm-hmm. boom. You know, two, four, six. He gets it. Like they're all these, all these. Well, film was probably very expensive, so they also yeah. did everything. Yep. Quicker. And then I also, uh, let's see, let's uh, it, it, everything was moving really fast. Um, 
I was, I, one note was like, is that supposed to be a werewolf? It looks like a hyena. Yes, it um, definitely <laughs> looked like a hyena. That was our comment. Too. It it, remi- it reminded me of um the bird with cl- uh, crystal plumage where when they actually showed the bird, <laughs> <laughs> like it doesn't look like a whatever. Not much plumage in that bird. Like, is that supposed oh. to be a werewolf? What? Is that supposed to be a werewolf? Oh. <laughs> werewolf. <laughs> werewolf. Werewolf. Yeah, castle. <laughs> uh, actually, you know what's funny? My uh today, it's, this is way off track. Um, my wife referred to SpaghettiOs as like Franken food. Okay. And my daughter didn't know what that was. My daughter's seven. Like, she just, what is Franken it's time to food? sit her down. And I was like, I was like, Eva, do you know, do you know who Frank, you know who Frankenstein is? And she's like, I think so. And I was like, okay. And my wife is like, Frankenstein's like a monster. Th- and I was like, no, no, <laughs> no. That's incidental. Listen, Frankenstein <laughs> is a scientist. Right. His name is Victor Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Right. And basically, I, I explained who Frankenstein was through. Uh, Absolutely. Through young Frankenstein. And Good man. I said that when he finally, you know, when the monster came to life, he was very nice and he, you know, you know, did it like a whole song and dance routine. Everyone was still afraid of him, but he just didn't like fire, right? right. So anyway, back I'm on not a reed. back yeah. on track. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back on track. You know how I knew that George was gonna love this movie? How I had my kids watch it. <laughs> my my eight year old twins. Uh, and I tell you, they were like locked in the whole movie. Nice. Like they were as into it as I was. And uh, yeah, I was like, okay, if this can hold their attention in a TikTok nice. world. Well, my next note was a whole day of traveling goes by in about 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. Was this movie made for the TikTok generation? That's yes. so good. It it was. It, it moves so fast. It was like end of act one already. And then, <laughs> uh, well, I'm thinking there's three acts. There's like seven acts. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, and it's it's weird. We have to think of how this movie was viewed. It was viewed in a movie theater, so it has like those those title cards, you yeah. know, it, that they don't obviously don't do anymore, it, right? And that was a, that's a thing that I that I that I noticed. I'm like, why even tell me that an act is ending and another act is beginning? Because they want to give you time uh, lapse. They want to kind of make you feel like you're watching a, a a longer story than you really are. They're giving you these little clapper boards to kind of give you okay okay that's not something that we do anymore it's not something nope. that we've done for a very long time no they do it in flashbacks it's like oh that's been 20 years how well his hair is gray now right <laughs> <laughs> so that's the new clapper board is like oh his hair is gray there's so. a there's an episode of uh community <laughs> I've where, heard of it. um <laughs> where uh <clears throat> abed um tries to um go back to three weeks earlier because they're on that what's happening is such a crazy thing that he's he's like this doesn't make any sense you need to have a flashback for this to make sense right for the audience yeah and everyone's like abed your life isn't a movie your life isn't a tv show like you can't just you know snap back to three weeks earlier and he tries to snap back to three weeks earlier and it's always just him trying to convince everyone that they need to establish something for when they flash back in three weeks from now. And they, none of them are giving the, him the time of day. And he just, he just, it just doesn't happen. He can't do it. It's so funny. Anyway. Sounds like uh, uh, maybe Back to the Future 4. It's season six and it's the whatever episode it is with the enormous hand. We'll get there. Yeah, it's good stuff. We'll get there. Anyway. I'm nowhere near season six. Did you guys watch? Uh, I did. I did. Season season three, three episode, episode, episode five. Yeah, five. Yeah. The scary. Oh my movie gosh! One. It was very funny. Can't can't <laughs> wait to talk about that one. It was way funnier than the rest of the show I've seen. So maybe that show does get good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this movie, Nasi. Um, da, 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 da. everything's moving really fast. Um. I don't remember Hutton getting on a boat to travel to Nasi's castle, but Nasi is taking a huge ocean-sized boat to get to Hutton's town, and Hutton is taking a horse. How does this geography work? He cuts him off at the pass, I think, at some point. 
to where he gets <laughs> back just in time. Uh, uh, That'll be cleaned up a little bit for you uh, a couple movies from now. Yeah. When they keep making the same movie over and over again, eventually <laughs> they streamline it into a bit yeah. more sensible order. I have a feeling these well, first two drew heavily from the stage play version rather than the book. Probably. Yeah. And so. Yeah, because my, my biggest problem with these both these movies were uh, they never really, and they might have, but I missed it. They, they almost assume that you've read the book because they don't really give you a lot of background on Count Dracula. There was a little bit of Mortal Kombat Annihilation going on. Where you were like, okay. oh, there's Jade. Oh. <laughs> oh, there's Cyrax. Like, if you haven't played the games, you have no idea why this character just jump kicked into frame. Like, <laughs> like my wife asked the, during the Bella Lugosi version, she's like, why is he going to London? And I said, I don't know. He bought some real estate. <laughs> like, I'm just like, yeah, it, I it's had, hard to explain. I had similar questions. Later on, it gets explained. Well, and they, I'm assuming it's in the book. They focus so heavily on the real estate in Nosferatu. And then in Dracula, they like hardly even go down that road. It was weird right. to me how one picked so much focus on the the business deal and the knock sending him and all these things. And then it's just a matter of perspective uh, what they picked well, to keep in, keep in the movie. But yeah, I guess I guess we'll get to it when we start talking about you know Dracula. But in in Nazi like. I really feel like everything kind of was there for a reason and everything tied together neatly. Oh, and yeah. you didn't have a whole lot of questions because like everything was just set in front of you very plainly. It was very right. what's German going on here. in that way, right? Like it was very, yeah, very exactly. plain, very straightforward, yeah. very a lot of things that we should probably talk about. Well, I think they were relying heavily on the visual, obviously, because it's a silent film. So, yeah. It's very streamlined and focused on framing the, you know, the images. Like we talk about with Halloween, where every shot is like a picture. Yeah. Like every yeah. scene is like a photograph or a painting. And that's when I watch Nosferatu, that's how I feel. Like everything is a still. Yeah, but not, yeah, that's, that's true. But not only that, like, you know, when Hutton goes to... Um, Orlock's castle, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, you know, why would any sane person go there? Oh, well, he would go there because he stands to make a lot of money. Right. Like, it's a plot point that is just totally, it's taken care of by a one line of, mm -hmm. not even dialogue, just one line of narrative uh, narration, which is, you know, the people who worked for Locke, Locke took care of them. Right. They made money. Yeah, like, and you can tell from the actor that, you know, he's kind of bumbling and naive because he's just got a hard on for Deutsche Markies and he's gonna go get his money. Exactly. And yeah. He yeah. portrays it's very, that everything it comes is very the screen. Very Yeah, it's very plainly like he stands to make a lot of money. This realtor, you know, pays his people well, probably because he's doing some shady shit. Mm. And you know, and, and Hutton's just like Okay. And well, his business partner looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <It's> like, <laughs> I mean, Hutton, your realtor, Wolf. <laughs> wolf. <laughs> <laughs> like he comes out holding those keys yeah. and he's got that ha the hat on. He's like, he's yeah. wearing his Sunday best. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, no. You could be in the nicest suit ever and it's not going to hide that face yeah. <laughs> or that hump. What hump? <laughs> what? <laughs> what hump? Yeah, my, my kid's uh, input was something like, why are his teeth like that? And I'm like, hmm. how do you answer that to a kid? So I was just like, <laughs> it was a choice the director made. Yeah. Made a bad Left plan. That. Oh, should we get into the dark stuff or should we just do a once yeah. over over Dracula before we do? Did you cover your notes? Are well, you I mean, awesome? I'm pretty much at the end. I said, uh, I noticed that um, I I made a note about the, the shadow when Nazi's coming for Ellen. The sh you mm -hmm. know the sh that On the wall. iconic thing we already talked about it, and then the jail cell is pretty cool. I didn't notice. In I guess it, the knock scene where he visits knock, there's a isn't there's a jail cell scene I believe. 
or did I dream that? What what am I supposed to notice about it though? It's I don't the same, really the same imagery of the of the shadow. Like they they okay. hammer home. It's it's hard to visualize back then or how to make it a visual of Dracula being able to transport. Like okay, later on in movies they cover it in much better ways, but even the Lugosi version, they had trouble through technology how to show his oh, transition. We'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, oh, I know you're going to cover bats. Um, <laughs> but just his transition from scene to scene and yeah. his body shifting, his shape shifting, and all these different things that Dracula does yeah. is hindered by the technology of the Absolutely. time. Absolutely, yes. That's a shame. But later it on, is, it it, yeah. it gets better. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it does. Um, and then I noticed that um, that Nasi had a reflection. There was one scene where he goes in front of the... Um, the, I guess you would call it like the dresser, the makeup. Yeah, the yeah, the dresser, the vanity, the, the vanity. Yeah, and he walks right in front of the the mirror, and like there's a reflection of him, like clear as day. So I was like, oh okay, that's weird because I didn't think vampires had a reflection. Mm. And I was like, I don't. And then in the next movie that we watched, he's afraid of mirrors. Not I, afraid of mirrors. He's afraid of the reveal. Right, that, so I'm like, okay, so yeah. it wasn't long before like that became a thing, right? Um, and then so sunlight turns him into a pile of ash. That kind of, yeah, that uh, makes sense. I have one note that says, so she gave. We're talking about Alan here, I guess. So she gave her life to spare the rest of the town from the plague. Did she even know she was doing that? It didn't seem like she fully consented. Well, the book hmm. that they kept going back to, which. I found hilarious that it was the same cheat that you have in modern movies where somebody Googles something, you know? Mm. It's just like, instead of Googling it, they just happen to have the exact right book to tell them exactly what to do. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, it keeps, like, appearing in their... Lo- like, in... Uh, like, it basically, it followed Hutton, right? Yeah, it that was... That little book. Yeah. He tried to get rid of it, and it, like, ended up in his bag again. Yeah. Spoiler alert, that's a plot point that happens in almost every vampire movie okay. there's always someone carrying a freaking book that has all the lore and everything you need to know <laughs> okay well in the second one they had they had a character but well yeah van helsing yeah, yeah. van helsing Which, in this movie was a book and yes yes uh yeah. in the in the text it was in like highfalutin oldie englishy translated from germany uh language but it it basically said that she had to die so if she understood if she could read uh, which I presume she could, because she followed the instructions. She knew what she was getting into. Well, she's in a silent movie, but she better know how to read. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Movie dialogue okay. by okay, PowerPoint. Cause it, yeah, it's okay because it seemed like uh, she's you know she she read it, but it wasn't like she was like okay that's what I'm gonna do. It seemed like she kind of got under a spell, and then that you know it wasn't like I I don't know. It, well, it's it's fine. These I, actors are they were they didn't learn the Stanislavski uh, technique or they didn't learn method yet like it's a different type of acting back then. I yeah all all I'm saying is I I thought that the like the innocent you know I don't know the innocent woman the the virgin if you will mm-hmm. whatever had to like had to like consent to be sacrificed in order for this to work and it didn't seem like that was totally done you know perfectly but whatever you're not going to find uh non problematic consent issues in a lot of vampire movies right yeah there's going to be a lot of problematic Thanks. behavior in all these movies oh yeah it's kind of their yeah. deal although i i love the later on the lore of they have to be invited in like they can't just enter they have to be invited. Yeah, and that was in that, be- that was in here yeah, a little bit. That becomes for sure pretty uh, uh, prominent in but some of the future movies. In in this movie and in the next one that we're going to talk about, I feel like both of those, like what you're talking about, you have to invite him in. I don't feel like it always happened with full consent of the will. There was, you know, th- whoever was, uh, you know, in. A kind of like a sort of like a dream state 
and she opens up the the windows. Is that that would be the Lucy character? Yeah, uh, okay. I don't. I forget her name. I don't know what her name it's is. It's in, in my notes. Nossi. But but you know, <coughs> oh, in Nossi it was Ellen, and in the next movie I forget. I have to look at my notes. But you know, she opens up the the doors to the balcony or whatever. But she's not doing that until after she's already kind of like under an, under a kind of spell. Right. It seems. Well, they're working out the kinks. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Throwing shit so against anyways, the wall, see what sticks. My last note is, oh well, the master is dead. The end. Looked like he had a heart attack. And then he like he went into smoke or whatever. He went right. Poof. Yeah, he, like did a pulled a Obi Wan Kenobi. He uh yeah <laughs> yeah he got hit with a run with a, Luke run yeah. a sun lightsaber. And thanks to Are yeah. You Afraid of the Dark, my kids were like, oh, he's gonna turn into smoke. And then he did. So, good job, <laughs> yeah. Are You Afraid of the Dark. Thank you, Nickelodeon, for, for yeah. what you did for the kids. A couple of things about Nosferatu. So, the the plot of Nosferatu supposedly takes place in 1838 during a plague outbreak. Uh, I did some digging, and I couldn't find any plague outbreaks in 1930, or excuse me, in 1838. However, there was a significant third uh, plague pandemic of the bubonic plague between 1855 and actually up through 1960 till they finally got that thing kind of under wraps. So it's not totally outside of the realm of like realism. You know, I mean the town of Visborg doesn't actually exist. So we're playing around with some of the facts here, but there's elements within Nosferatu that we have to discuss and it's going to involve some uh, darkness. So, how are you guys feeling okay. with the darkness? Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm good with it. Okay. Darkness? So, here's the deal. Like, this movie comes out in 1922. It's made in 21. Uh, just keep in mind that the Treaty of Versailles was signed in 1919. So, we're talking early Weimar Germany at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. The lowest point... For the German people since probably pre-Roman era at this point as the, you know, value of the currency has been destabilized and they've been punished for their own crimes and the crimes of the Russians and the crimes of all these other countries that all got heaped onto Germany at the end of World War I. Mm -hmm. They're also in the middle of the um, Spanish flu pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, did you catch that imagery? in this movie like the constant you could tell it was made during a pandemic uh way that they're treating this plague issue notice the plague issue doesn't come up at all in dracula when it's made in right. one no. but this movie is just like plague 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 left and right we got yes. plagues yes we're marking doors with crosses because everybody's dying like we're yeah. all we're missing is the cart you know the bring out your yes. dead yeah and they even had that they had didn't they have the coffins? They were just carrying coffins yeah, they through were the streets. Dragging coffins yeah. all over the place. I and mean the it's imagery of the rats, all the rats. Rats mm -hmm. all over the place for the bubonic yeah. side of it. This is a movie made in the midst of, you know, all the shit that's about to yeah. unfold in the world. And it's wild. Like uh, recently I watched a movie, Pearl, that takes place in nineteen eighteen or nineteen nineteen in America. And it was made during the COVID pandemic, but, the, you know, they were hearkening back to all the Spanish flu stuff. And it's like, now that we've been through all that and we've seen it in our own time to then see it not only made in our time looking back at a previous time, but now made in the previous time looking back at the one before that. Like, it's just all very oddly circular watching it now. Uh, that part I didn't really plan on. Uh, it's not oddly circular. It's exactly that. It's really circular. It's it, on the. It's it just is plain German it circular. <clears throat> it always has been, and it will continue to be. It's really interesting. But here's here's the thing, and uh, the audience needs to know that I didn't I didn't know that you two were gonna refer to Nosferatu by that nickname this entire episode. What was the nickname? Nasi. 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 So every time you guys said that, I cringed a little. Uh, oh, why? Because here's the thing. <laughs> there are two characters in this film who are given traditionally stereotypical Jewish features and jobs. And it's Nock and it's Orlock. 
to the point that like the design of Orlock is super scary, but it's also like super anti-Semitic. If yes. you like take it at no pun intended face value for how they design the, the nose and the ears and the, so this movie's amazing as a vampire story with an iconic looking villain. It's just unfortunate that that iconic looking villain is like this horrifying anti-Semitic character who along with the rats and the plague and this traditional within European, but also German culture of at the time blaming the Jewish people for all things that went wrong in their country, including bubonic plague, including Spanish flu, including world wars, like all these things that are kind of coalescing on Germany. And it's, it feels like one of those kind of knee jerk, like overreactions where you're just like, man, we can't just blame everything on, you know, anti-Semitism. We can't just blame everything on these traditional hates because there's a lot of nuance, but we're talking about 1922 in the lead up to the Nazification of Germany, right? The, the, hmm. This isn't like, this isn't a drill. This is the real one. And it's starting to yeah. unfold in front of the world. And this is one of the early examples of like mass media just really, you know, losing all nuance and going straight to the, the hate. Right. Is there any like, um, writings or articles or interviews with the the director and or the creator of this movie that would where they question them on that i didn't because see anything Nosfer, obviously nosferatu is an older word than any kind of uh yeah but he's talking about thing. the image right but i'm saying the nickname like, nasi which i've only said that because i collect horror memorabilia and people call him that why does why does the word Nazi have? Oh, yeah. Okay. There it is. That just, yeah. <laughs> I just got it. Yeah. Right. Like, it's just so, weird. I'd never opposite, heard that as a I, nickname. I'd never heard that, but I don't, I mean, I've, yeah, I've heard it, but I've never made the connection. But it's like the 1920s, the 1930s in Germany are a very unique time because everything appeared okay for a long time. <clears throat> because they had a republic and they were, you know, making amends for what they quote unquote did, you know, uh, what parts they did and what other people did that they were blamed for in the Versailles Treaty. Like they were apparently on the way to a better time. And then, you know, some stuff happened and then it it was mm. very not okay for a long time. And so this movie just exists right at the very beginning of that. In a yeah. way that it's like, if you don't have World War II and you don't have the Holocaust and you don't have all those things, and instead they just kind of, you know, take that 1922 energy and stay out of the the depths. You know, they they keep they keep it regular horrible Europe and not like what's to come. You could be like, right. oh man, those Europeans really need to work on those those anti-Semitic tropes because that that's not cool, you know. But instead, you're like right on the cusp of one of the worst things that's ever going to happen in human history. And the signs are there that like stuff's kind of bad right now. And people aren't going to. Oh, it's weird, man. Any of the Weimar stuff freaks me out a little bit. Anything made in the Weimar period, because now that we know what's coming. You start to see things that, you know, as a viewer, even what led to it. Yeah, well, you just and you see the seeds in society that. You know, if it didn't happen, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, it's a good thing those seeds didn't grow into something worse. But this is like the ultimate case of like those seeds grew into the worst thing. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Well, like I said, I've been watching this movie for 35 years. And the only thing I ever thought of it associated with what you're talking about is that it was a German made film. I never even looked at the connotation of his visual it's, it's again it's, and that's what i hung up on his visual and i always looked at it as not anti-semitic but just a creepy 
like a ghoulish look. Like I never yeah. thought of it associated to any human being. So yeah. fail on their end if that's what they were doing. Maybe at the time, you know, it's propaganda for the people that they're speaking to. But that kind of sh- I think that's shed away for anybody who grew up on this movie who was born when I was born. You know, yeah. in the seventies. You don't like we didn't think about the that yeah and also when we when we watch this movie now at least for me i i i watch it thinking like you know in in admiration of nosferatu right like i don't see nosferatu as like you know something that's ruining my society right you know like i He's a loner, Dowdy. You know, I, <laughs> I I don't think that, like, the character is something that we look down on. Right. But I now, always thought of it least. as, like... But I get it. I Now that it's been put in front of me like that, like, yeah, I get it. Do you remember like, when we evil, talked about... The evil character has these characteristics. Mm. I, I get it. Remember we talked about but, how in the 50s nobody wanted to see a movie about the Cold War, but they'd watch alien movies like crazy? Yeah. Because it was yeah. like symbolic. Yes. What we talked about then was the other, right? Like there's us and then there's not necessarily them because that them sounds too equal, but there's the other, the outside, the alien that's coming. And these vampires based on the Bram Stoker books, both um, these vampires based on Bram Stoker, they're both very the other. And unfortunately the German one is very because I mean when you think of geographically the difference between Germany and Transylvania, I mean it's it's a little bit like you know uh, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York, New Jersey. Like yeah, they're they're the other side of the thing, but they're really you know <laughs> in all intents and purposes not that far apart. But culturally, yeah. you know, there's that otherism, that outsider, that that thing which is you know in the case of Nosferatu bringing plague, corrupting, and bringing disease that's not just killing direct victims of this vampire, but just like scores of people throughout this town, all blamed on this one horrible, corrupting force, which is Nosferatu. I'm wondering, because uh, Stoker, I believe, is Irish. I wonder if uh, that was his, obviously not being anti Semitic, but what was his intent in creating this character and did the I creators think. of Nosferatu take it to that level? I think it's, it's just not, there. I think it's the latter. So it's just not there, but they took it and, yeah. and personified it. So yeah. I'm glad gotcha. you brought that up because that transitions very well into Dracula. So we're going to wrap that up here today. Uh, we're going to dovetail later into the Dracula thing. Thank you to our audience for sitting through an episode we recorded all at once but split into two because you don't need two hours straight of radio, do you? You don't. Maybe you do? You don't get it this time. Happy Halloween, everybody. It's nice to be back. We missed doing this for you guys. Uh, Probably not going to be on our regular schedule for a while, but, you know, enjoy it while you got it. Hopefully you got another one coming soon with Dracula. Stay safe out there and check your candy for razor blades. (laughs) 